Okay, welcome to our webinar today on how to handle screen time without punishment, which is what we call non-punitive. So I want to thank you all for joining me. And my name is Judy Arnell. Sorry, I was running. <laughs> and I'm a certified Canadian family life educator. And <clears throat> today I want to talk to you a little bit about the science behind screen time. And and it's the number one parenting issue I find when I speak or do groups that parents are very concerned about exceeding the recommendations. I haven't met one parent that doesn't exceed the recommendations, so, um, but they worry about it. And I'm going to talk to you about that and also ways that you can handle screen time without um, being um, too, <laughs> too harsh about it, okay? So I'm, that's me, and this is my family. I'm an idealist. I go to conferences. I know what the recommendations are, but I, I'm real, too. I have five kids who I will come clean here and tell you have grossly exceeded screen time recommendations. Now, <laughs> my kids range in age from 16 to 26. So when... I had three kids, all under three, and when um, they were born, oh, thank you for the tea. When they were born, all we had really were VCRs. So, <laughs> but then again, when you had limitless shows, they watched something like The Lion King at least six times a day. So you times up by an hour and a half. That's like a lot of hours of Lion King. <laughs> The only difference between my older kids and my younger kids is that now screens are on the go everywhere. In the cars, in the doctor offices, you can bring an iPad anywhere. So that's a huge difference. Um, whereas we only had screens at home. So what did we do in the car? We had to talk. So anyways, these are my kids now. Um, so back to that, and we're all video gamers, except me. <laughs> But everybody loves video and computer games. So, and the other thing I should tell you is we are unschoolers. So when you unschool, you don't have um, very structured days. You don't have to be anywhere. And that was, you have lots and lots of hours to fill time. So my kids played a lot of video games, <laughs> very much so. Um, but one of the parents' fears is how harmful is that and what are they going to do when they actually have to go to school and get a job? What are they going to do? Well, they did it. <laughs> My three oldest kids all graduated university. And when they learned to manage their time and when they were um, not gaming or they needed to do assignments or it was exam season, they buckled down and did what was required of them. So it, childhood is a stage. When kids need to do it, they do it. So my that's my three oldest. And then my fourth child, he's in first year university. And then I have my youngest child who um, spends his day playing League of Legends and all those wonderful games. So that's our, our family and our experience. Um, I also teach Parenting courses, I teach the parent effectiveness training and the terrific toddlers, and I've written books. So my um, favorite book is Discipline Without Distress. It's a bestseller, and um, the Parenting with Patience book is about <clears throat> how to handle our anger, because that is the first step of positive discipline, is getting a grip ourselves, and then the second step is what are you going to do? <laughs> after everyone's calm. How are you going to solve the problem? So um, both books are available on Amazon. They've been translated into different languages. And I got new books out. Yay, I'm so excited. So the Attachment Parenting Tips, Raising Toddlers to Teens, is just tips, no theory. A little bit of tips on brain development, but also any parenting problem. I'll show you what it looks like. So you can put it on your phone and you can if you have a problem, you can look it up. It's all categorized from babies to um, teens. And then it comes up with some tips that I've amassed over teaching groups. 
through the years. The next book I have coming out is Unschooling to University. Um, and that's going to be released September 1st. So that's kind of our journey on um, us and um, the profiles of 30 of our friends who all um, unschooled and got to university and college. Okay, enough of my blurb. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> so where does the information come from I'm going to present today? Uh, Canadian Pediatric Society, Health Canada, Alberta Health Services, the Palex Foundation, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Okay, if you want to stay in touch with me beyond today, feel free to join my Facebook page. It's Judy Arnell. And my group, I have a group called Professional Parenting. It's kind of like PD. <laughs> okay, one thing I want to talk about is addiction. A lot of parents are worried. Are, is my child addicted? Are they going to get addicted if we exceed screen time? Um, and I know a lot of people worry about it, doctors, teachers, professionals out there, but it's not, it's something I do want to address. So what, of this list, what do you think is not technology? Okay, right, a strawberry. <laughs> Everything else is technology. And it's, technology can be good or bad, it depends on how we use it. Screen time is defined as anything with a screen that's electronic, so all these things are screen time. And like I said, it's, there's a lot of pros with screen time. Definitely on the parental side, as you can see, it, it, it gives us all these lovely things which is why it's so addicting for us. <laughs> and on the child side, um, there's some pros too. I mean, it, there's some good things. When they need to be quiet, like on a plane or in church, it is so wonderful. And it does introduce them to topics that and increases their learning. There's lots of pros. Okay, here comes the con slide. <laughs> So as you can see, there's more pros on the parent side and more cons on the child side. So these are some concerns about screen time. Um, I'm not going to read out these things you can read. And these are generated from the groups I do with parents. Okay. so. Can you get all the benefits of the pro side without electronics? And I ask parents, well, what did we do 10 years ago? When we're sitting in a restaurant trying to amuse our kids before the food comes, what did we do? Well, we gave them the whole stack of sugar packets and say, fill something. <laughs> so um, we can, we can live without electronics, but do we have to? I mean, there's a lot of things that just make life way easier. So let's talk about that. So we are living in a digital world, absolutely. And we wanna practice conscious digital consumption. And I'm sure you all do that anyways right now. So that involves wh who your child is, what affects them, what content they're watching, and what context. So let's talk about the science behind that. Um, there's no clear evidence-based conclusions of the effect of technology on older children, just because the technology is so recent. We've had smartphones for 10 years, we have iPads for eight years. We do not have any good data still on what are those effects on older children. We do have data on younger children that it does impact language development, um, but is it addictive? We don't have enough evidence yet, and that's why um, video games or internet addictions is not in the DSM-5, which is the Bible of medical um, definitions and treatment. So common advice is to err on the side of caution. So um, a lot is closest in nature to gambling, but most professionals are advocating for just be moderate and have some life balance. And that's what's good, right? Um, everybody needs to be have balance in their lives in regards to technology, both children and us parents, for sure. Okay, um, so anybody who gives um, advice out there, it's often their own opinion. <laughs> but hopefully we'll have more 
more statistics. One thing we do know about brains is are some people more prone to addictions than others? And the short answer to that is yes, um, but a very, very small proportion. Um, addictions are genes, and genes are <laughs> in our makeup. It, they're like the little red Lego blocks in this house. A house represents a brain. And what activates those genes for addiction predisposition? What is it? We know that toxic stress can activate it, um, and toxic stress arises from adverse childhood experiences. And we also know that just some brains are born with those kinds of fault lines that um, can be expressed or not expressed. And we don't have enough science there yet to tell us which ones get expressed by which way. So, but I do want to say that most. Yes, internet, social media, video games are very compelling. They have things built in them to compel us and our children to keep coming back. But are they addictive? Mm, can't say for sure yet. We have a question. Is there a way of turning off the addictive genes? And that's, that's what we are trying to find in science is is there a way we can do that? And so far, we don't know a way yet. All we can do is reduce our, our toxic stress in ourselves, in our children. And um, if we notice um, compelling behavior, like there are 10 types of addictions. There's substance addictions, which is coffee. <laughs> we have those. <laughs> Cigarettes. Um, alcohol, those kinds of things. Um, and then there's process addictions, which are work, sex, shopping, um, internet, gambling, those kinds of things. And it doesn't matter which addiction we pick. If we have a predisposition to addictions, we're going to pick one of them. And we have to realize how much does it affect our life? Like coffee, does that affect our life that much? Right? That is livable. So the question is, thinking along the lines of Chantix, like what makes the body physically ill and not want it? I never used it, but as a nurse years ago, I heard that effect from that med. Okay. Um, the body isn't so much addicted to electronics. It's more of a, a dopamine thing in the brain. So like when your phone goes off, when it pings, it stimulates that dopamine <laughs> hit, and we think, oh, somebody's sending us something. We've got to go find out, um, that kind of thing. But that is something that we can train ourselves not to do, right? So they tell people, if you're really compelled to check your phone while you're driving, lock your phone in the truck for, for your home, you know, and work on ways like that that you can minimize its effect in your life because it's really, really hard to live in a world um, and not drink coffee or not use technology when our whole world is like that. So it's just noticing those problems. Okay, so I talked about stress. Now, toxic stress is nasty, stressful things that um, are not supported by an adult <laughs> or a caring person. So if you are a caring person, and you obviously are because you're at this webinar today. Um, your kids do not have toxic stress in their lives because you are there to support them. So anything bad that happens, you are there to comfort them, to buffer them, and that makes it tolerable stress. So they probably do not have toxic stress in their lives, which is good because that doesn't um, release cortisol, um, which is a stress hormone. When I talked about ACEs, I talked about these 10. This is, <laughs> I talk about the parenting list of no-nos. This is the list of don't do these things when you're parenting. <laughs> Anything else you do, whether you're an attachment parent, a free-range parent, a snowplow parent, doesn't matter, really. Really, really, really. And, but these things do matter. These 10 adverse childhood experiences 
because they matter, they, because what they are is their parents that are not there supporting or comforting someone. So it can be toxic to, to the child. So these are the things to avoid. And like I said, you know, adults are that buffer. They can buffer that toxic stress against a child. So that's a good thing. Okay, now we know kids. Let's go through each age group and talk about what kids use and how to mitigate it, how to take it away, <laughs> be nice without screaming, <laughs> screen time without scream time. Okay, so kids develop in four dimensions all at the same time. Okay, um, now babies are born with um, a hundred billion of these little brain cells. These are neurons. They have axons and dendrites. And for the most part, as you can see in this slide, they're not connected. The ones connected are for the heart and lungs and keep them going and breathing. But for their brains, um, learning, a lot of them aren't. But by the age of seven, you can see the brain has made a lot of connections. A lot of neurotransmitters were sent over those gaps, which we call synapses. And then in the teen brain, it starts pruning the ones that are not used and strengthening the ones that are used a lot. So it runs more efficiently. So babies, let's look at babies and toddlers. So from about zero to three years, okay? Their whole job is to explore with all their five senses, everything goes in the mouth, <laughs> and be nurtured and have their needs met. So their job is to develop trust and attachment. Older toddlers, more exploring. What happens here is the limbic system of the brain is very sensitive. So lots of feelings are coming out, but they're, their verbal ability is not so great. So you get a lot of tantrums, no self-control. So you get a lot of hitting, pushing, biting. They want to be independent, but they're not. They have security issues and um, their attachment is very strong. So separation anxiety is very strong too. Okay. So those are normal things. I love this slide. This kind of shows you that as far as self-control goes, which is one component of executive function, under threes don't have it, right? <laughs> Even if you look here around four, they're getting it, but not to the level they do at age six. And this is why kids don't start mandatory school until age six, because they don't have a whole lot of self-control. Yes. Now, you can see too, the school age years are a lot better. So when you hand your phone over to your baby to keep them quiet, say your baby's 18 months, and then it's time to get off the bus and you want your phone back and the baby doesn't want to give your phone back. <laughs> I've seen this. <laughs> and baby starts throwing your phone because they're mad. Um, this is not really a discipline issue. It's a development issue because they don't have self-control to say, okay, mom, here's the phone back. <laughs> they don't have the memory to know that they might get it back later. So you're going to get a tantrum. Um, so at this age, the best thing to do is try and avoid giving babies your stuff. Um, if you can get their own little play phone, although a lot of kids do know the difference. So um, even in the preschool years, they don't have a whole lot of self-control, but they do by about age six. So if you say by age six, okay, I need my phone back, we're getting off the bus, chances are your child's going to hand it over. And that's without any teaching or <laughs> any discipline interference it's just a development a good development okay so babies and toddlers use a lot of things they watch movies but they don't really watch them um, things like Peppa Pig and and Paw Patrol those kinds of things um, three-year-olds starting to use online games computer games mostly parents phones and tablets and wearable technology this is what I would be concerned about is wearable technology. We have no long-term studies on that. Um, and if you look at an iPad's user instructions and it says when you're transferring data from a phone to an iPad, keep a distance of 10 inches. That tells me why are we putting these things so close to kids whose skin is thin and environmental toxins, they pick up 
very easily because their skin is so thin. So I would be very careful of things like that. Safety tips. Um, <coughs> They don't have any, so don't worry about it. They can't <laughs> get into much trouble on the internet. <laughs> if they do go to a wrong site, like you know a porno site or something, babies and toddlers will only take in what they can handle, so they probably wouldn't understand it. Uh, recommended screen times in Canada, none. We're a little stricter than the US. The US is uh, under 18 months, none except video chat, under two years, about 20 minutes a day with the parent. So um, most parents do exceed that. Now, there's no evidence that screens cause developmental problems, but there's no evidence that screens help learning either. The ability to use screen time does not equate to the ability to understand it. So like we all use a car, but we, me, I don't understand what's happening under my hood. <laughs> and I don't need to. All I need to know is the car works. So that kind of tells parents, if you think your kids are learning stuff, they would learn just as much on real toys. Okay. The, the, the problem is it's very passive. It engages the eyes and ears. So kids do need to know, they need language development, they need to talk to a lot of adults to develop that, they need to run and play, so they need that physical coordination, and they need real toys that um, they can explore with five senses, not just two senses. Okay, so these are all the instances that kids use screens, <clears throat> but they also need real playthings, like this little baby with the toy there. Okay, now in Canada, one in four kids are at risk for language development because they're not getting parents to talk to them. So if you talk to your parent, or you talk to your kids a lot, read to them, sing to them, you know, do those little finger plays like the eensy weensy spider went up the water spout, those kinds of interactions. So when they pester you for attention and you give them attention, they're going to be fine, absolutely fine, even if they do exceed screen time recommendations. You just have to keep up that balance between adult interaction, developing their language skills, and um, what they do on screens. <clears throat> so best practices here, comfort, play, protect, sing, read, talk to them. Be sensitive to their needs. If they want your attention, stop and give it to them. Give them engagement, okay? Um, also, keep in mind that kids learn from adults what is and isn't important. So if you put down your phone and give them attention, you're telling them people are more important than devices, okay? Um, technology is marketed to adults as education and entertaining, but there's no supporting evidence for that. Problems. <laughs> so pestering behavior, that's not a bad thing. Um, if kids pester you, that means they need attention. So give them, a, it's a basic need. And uh, kids under age five need a lot of attention. They really do, okay? Um, make sure your supervision is adequate. And um, it's easy to use parenting tools to occupy the child, but again, build in that talk time. Okay, that's what we call serve and return interactions, right? When you're actually interacting, you talk to the kids, the kids talk back, you laugh, it keeps the conversation going. That's what builds their brain cells too. How do you manage screen time at that age? Um, kids are pretty good. If they have toys around, you could redirect them to new activities. And they love spending time with you. So if you're in the play, <laughs> they'll want to be in the play too. Okay. Alrighty. Um, these are great play materials. More the toys on the left because they're open-ended and they can be combined in different ways. The play materials on the right are more for older kids because they there's only one right way to play with them. So have lots of these play materials around. Now when kids get to school age, a lot of parents pack these up and give them away or sell them. And if you really want kids to go off screen time in the school age years, make sure you don't pack these away. Have lots of these out because it's very helpful to redirect them too. This is what we used. 
when we traveled or went to restaurants or public places, instead of handing over an iPad, we brought this kit. This is just a little lunch bag. It's got a big long handle on so you can carry it or throw it in the diaper bag. So we have things like pipe cleaners, markers and paper, Play-Doh, dice, bouncy balls, cards. Cards are, and dice are great for teens and school age kids. Um, safety scissors, tape, pens, markers, and a flashlight. And this would keep kids busy. They'd create things. They would manipulate them. They'd make little dolls out of the pipe cleaner. They would draw a little house with the paper and then the dolls would play in the house. It stimulates their imagination and their fine motor skills. And so later, they, <laughs> they have that to build on. Um, my son, who's the engineer, when he was two, his favorite toy were those door stoppers. And those door stoppers that, you know, they go twang, twang. <laughs> and he would lie in his belly and just twang those all day until he couldn't stand the noise anymore. And when he's 20 years later, he's in engineering class and learning about sound oscillations and <laughs> studying those door stops, right? So, so he was saying his experiential knowledge in the early years helped him understand how that worked when he was in engineering class. So, so experiential learning and play and toys builds those layers for later learning when it's more theoretical. Okay, let's look at preschoolers. Now, they're starting to roll their brains and starting to figure out where you hide everything. <laughs> so they're uh, no logic. They're not logical yet. And that's why logical consequences don't work for this age. They don't have that ability to critically think, hmm, if I do this, I wonder if this will happen. Don't have that yet. But they are lovely children. Um, they have a lot. These are some characteristics of preschoolers. Again, short attention span. They're very creative. They're magical thinking at this stage. So you want to tap into growing that creativity. And they have no sense of time. So if you say, okay, you get 30 minutes on the iPod, they don't know what 30 minutes is. They don't get that until about age seven. Okay, so timers are really good at this age. If you want to limit things, use a timer, use colors, use um, space. Let them see how much a time is. Okay, what do preschoolers use? They use all these things. They're starting to understand video game consoles like the Wii U. I, at this age, my son was on Facebook. <laughs> I know it's bad. He should have been 13. But um, he could use the icons. He couldn't read yet, but he could use the icons to, um, at about age four or five, to m work his way through um, Farmville, those games. So at this age, recommended screen time is only one hour a day. And this is the Canadian Pediatric Society and the American Academy of Pediatric Recommendations. One hour a day. Recommended physical activity in the Canadian Pediatric Society is three hours per day of active play. So running around the house, building forts, um, chasing each other, that kind of stuff, moving. And one hour of energetic play, such as going for a walk, running around the playground, those kinds of things. Again, at this age, kids learn through five senses. And yes, that tasting, everything goes in their mouth. Hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, tasting. Same as the toddlers. So best practices here, make time and space for play other than screen time, okay? And again, it encourage, give attention, listen to them when they pester you, they want something, give your attention, make sure you read books to them, sing to them, talk to them, and that'll keep them really good. Um, one study found that interactivity doesn't mean real learning. So when children read books, ebooks, and there were hot spots they could click on that interrupted the story flow, it actually distracted from the story, kind of like those uh, pop-up books used to do. <laughs> so um, not don't assume that all screen time is good learning. Well, how you can limit screen time at this age, 
redirect. So you want to say, okay, time's out for the iPad in five minutes, five minutes. Show them what five minutes is. And then when you come back, you say, okay, time's up. Five minutes is gone. And then re have something set up that you can redirect them to and say, okay, look, I set up the paints. I set up the Play-Doh. I set up the sandbox. Let's go do that. And, or you could say, come play with me. Invite companionship. Let's go bake cookies or let's go do this. So they will always pretty well come if you're involved. Okay. Now, if you can't do that and time's up, you can at least acknowledge their feelings. And what you do there is say, I know it's so much fun watching Peppa Pig, but we have to go do dinner. I know it's very hard. I'm with you. So acknowledge their feelings, right? <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> Limits is something you have to impose in parenting. And with positive discipline, there's no problem imposing limits. And your child is going to scream, tantrum, and not like the limits. And that's okay. That is not stressful for their brain. That is tolerable stress. Because you're around to acknowledge their feelings. And, and, and don't discipline that. Don't punish that. They're entitled to their feelings. They don't like it. But the limits impose. And that's okay. It really is. Okay, we have a question. Oh yeah, Peppa Pig. <laughs> okay, so you wanna, when they are engaged in play, be careful what the background is. So turn off screens, turn off the TV, and let them just play. We, we have so much background noise that it can be very distracting and it can damage hearing, it can, uh, it doesn't need to be there. You want to watch consumerism. There's a lot of advertising embedded in games for kids. Yeah, by age 18 months, kids can identify logos. So <laughs> that's why <laughs> a lot of websites get kids involved because it builds that brand recognition. Okay, um, you want to watch and see what personal information they're giving. A lot of five-year-olds can write. And keep up that serve and return, that interaction, that reading. So kids start to gain self-control around age five. So back to here. Around here, you can start saying, okay, you know what? We only have an hour of screen time before we have to go to the doctor. And they may go, oh, but they start to understand how much an hour is and they don't complain too much about screen time then. And don't worry, I mean, you have lots of, lots of stages in which to interact with kids. So a lesson that doesn't get taught in the preschool years is gonna be taught later on. You still got 18 years to read. There are no magic windows to understand things. And kids get better at self-control as they get older. So there's a lot, there's some things you don't even have to address and they will just get better at, such as having a good work ethic. Okay, for those of you with older kids, let's go to school age years, six to 12. And recommended screen time here used to be two hours a day. And then when I started teaching these workshops, and then um, due to public pressure and our changing world, uh, both the Canadian Pediatric Society and the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics, both took out time limits and said, just have balance. Like, just have balance and other things in your day. Recommended physical activity is 30 minutes a day. So <laughs> these are my kids. I, I got tired. They were on screens all weekend. And I said, go outside and play. And it was really quiet in the house. And I went outside in the deck. And they're playing we through the glass in the family room. <laughs> they can work through a half inch of glass. So what can you do? So again, like I said, don't pack away all your paints and your Lego and all those messy things. Kids need to still engage their five senses. Maybe not so much. They don't put things in their mouths anymore. Um, and they're not smelling things as much. But 
hearing, seeing, touching, talking, and doing. Doing is way better than just hearing and seeing on a screen. Okay, you may have heard that in North America, our PISA scores have dropped in math. And one of those, some of the research that's coming out is that math is no longer three-dimensional to two-dimensional. Even when kids play Monopoly now, they don't get real paper money anymore. They get these little credit cards they slide through the slider to, and so they're losing that ability to count and learning, losing that ability to understand multiples. So math is going more two-dimensional where we experience in, in three-dimensional. And that could be a problem with our math scores. So this is what school-agers do. This is their normal development. <clears throat> And I'll give you a minute to read that. So at this age, kids still like to play with toys. You'll notice about age 13, pretty well, their toys are mostly all electronic. But um, things like Lego, blocks, um, dolls, Playmobil, all of those things kids still love to play with at this age, so don't pack it away. Here's the screen things they like to use. So the big thing here is around tweens, they're moving from content users to content creators. So they're moving their creativity from painting and Play-Doh to a screen, so through, through blogs or memes or anything that they make and post and share. So this is where that, so what's your role here? Your role is still your teacher, you provide three-dimensional plays, activities like Lego and painting, uh, but you're still a scaffolder, you're still helping them shape that brain until they have full self-control, they can do it themselves. and Instead of punishment, you are gonna facilitate their problem solving. So let's say your child is, this was a real problem in our house with gaming. With gaming, kids work on teams. <laughs> they used to be guilds or whatever. And because the teams are not limited to your time zone, they would be playing with kids across the world. And they'd all agree to go together and play as a team. But the problem is, if it's your supper time and you expect everyone to be at the table, but they're gaming and can't leave, that's an issue, right? So a lot of parents would just go in and turn off their computer and bam, punish them, right? Which is not very good for communication. So what we do is we sat down and problem solved it. And we said, okay, here's my needs. My needs is I want a family dinner, but here's your needs. Your needs is you want it play this game with a group. So what are we gonna do? And then you work with the child. The child comes up with ideas to solve the problem. So we came up with a few ideas. Um, we would say every other day would be family dinner and every other day you could play your game or whatever. Whatever works that everybody agrees to and everybody's kind of happy about. So that really helps in, in getting kids off screens at this age. Um, safety tips. Now, kids are getting internet-enabled phones. It used to be about age 13, but it's come down. The average age now is about 10. So, if they have internet, um, these are all the things you have to talk about. <laughs> so, as you probably know, if uh, those of you who have teens, um, especially buying things online, kids have no idea. Uh, those are things they never teach. Like they teach things like this at school, but how to buy things the schools do not teach. So you really need to. I would say if you can put off getting your child a cell phone as long as you can, do it. Um, our unschooled kids didn't have cell phones till they were like 17, 18, because they didn't need them really. They didn't go much. <laughs> anywhere that they couldn't borrow a phone to phone me um, plus they're expensive so if you can avoid 
giving them a cell phone as long as possible, do it, do it, do it. It just alleviates a whole lot of headaches. Hey, use the rating guide. And how do you limit screen time? Okay. Best way is to set limits with them. So sit down and say, okay, <clears throat> school year's coming up. What is our family? What are we going to use for um, limits? Are we going to have like two hours a day or no screens through the week or some on weekends? But make sure your kids buy into it. You, they have to be a, a participant in this. Um, <clears throat> you want to model um, balance and you want to plan ahead and negotiate. So I found a ticket system was really helpful. I give the kids one ticket per hour of screen time. So they could spend all the whole week's worth on Sunday, or they could, it gives them a way to manage what and what they could do or to plan their week out. If they had a week where they had a lot to do, soccer, then they would do less screen time, but they always knew they could spend and make it up on the weekend, which is kind of easy. Um, okay. Oh, okay, someone wrote in and said they have a program called Secure Team that allows you to set it. They all sign a contract and they have minute to minute reading screen time. Oh, okay. So you set up how many, if they've read eight hours a week, they can screen time eight hours a week then, maybe. That's a good idea. Yeah, so you set the times to use the websites and the apps allowed. Yeah, okay, and, and that works really, really good. <clears throat> my experience is, <coughs> excuse me, when my kids, <clears throat> all my kids hit the teen years, <laughs> they could work around a lot of my limits. <laughs> but for this age, it works, yeah, absolutely. Oh, good, okay, so this person now allows one hour per day screen, and then they can bank reading time. That's great. Awesome. Yeah, that's good. So definitely get your kids involved. Um, now, if they, if they are really keen, they want to play a violent video game, right? What I would do is sit down and negotiate. There's nothing wrong with negotiation. It's a great relationship skill, and it's way better than punishing kids. I mean, it's, it's negotiating their needs, but your needs too. And it's getting everybody's needs on the table and trying to work something out. And that's the adult way to deal with problems. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what else can you do? So contracts, write up contracts. Um, I have a contract on my website at professionalparenting.ca under the articles section. And I also have it on my blog at um, judyarnell.com. My contract is non-punitive. What that means is that you don't threaten to take away their devices. But you get all your needs on there, and the kids get their needs on, and you sign it, and you refer to it <laughs> when the needs are not being met. <laughs> so if you want a non-punitive contract, that might be helpful. Oops. Okay. The other thing you can do is family conferences. So if your kids are spending too much time on the screens, um, sit down and say, okay, everybody, what, what are we going to do about this? And, and talk about it, right? And having routines is helpful. If you have a routine through the week that works, um, has different times for screen time, that might be more preferable to, to um, contracts. Alrighty. Oh, yeah, here's, a, here's where a contract is. And it's non-punitive. Now, we gotta recognize that kids are social. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're not supposed to go on social media until 13, but they do. So <laughs> parents, make sure um, 
you learn where the settings are and um, be a friend to lurk, not post. Don't do any of your parenting on their social media walls. And please, no internet shaming. I know, I know some people do it, but it is just, uh, I think that's just so hard to get rid of, so hard. Um, kids, should teach your kids not to post anything of them with alcohol or nudity. Um, actually, in our family, our kids didn't use their real names anywhere on the internet until they were about 18. And that way, because kids make mistakes, they, you know, they don't think logically, they're still growing their brains till they're age 25. So that way, their mistakes are under somebody else's name. Okay, that's, keep going. And social media is a part of life. This is really neat. These are a group of young 20 year old kids in a pub and, and they were playing cards. They weren't. And if you notice their behavior, once one person gets on their phone, all the rest do. And then they're on their phones for 10 minutes, not talking to each other. And then they all put them away, which I think is kind of neat. Like it's our new social, social, um, social things that we do. And be careful what you post. This is my friend. She posted this and she's got a very good high level job, but this is, this is not something that's appropriate that you want to post. <laughs> so keep in mind with kids, most new friends still come from real life interactions and then they connect and strengthen those online. But make sure you schedule breaks from screens, like chores are a good time to just play music, um, have, make sure you have outdoor time. So, um, and they will go outdoor and play if you go with them. So go on walks, go rollerblading, go bike riding, go on family picnics. Um, don't pack away your toys or your messy stuff. They need still five senses learning. Okay. Now I found you have the most power to negotiate before anything's turned on. So if your child wants the iPad and you have to get out the house to a doctor's appointment, I find negotiating before they get it has the best results. So say, okay, but remember this time you only get it for 10 minutes, 10 minutes, because we have to go and get their agreement and make sure they get their eye contact so you know they're listening, right? So that's most helpful. Overeating and inactivity, that's a problem, but we're part of the problem too. We drive our kids everywhere. So try and bike and walk as a family. And make sure eating is a solitary activity. It's not, um, it's not something, don't have screens at the table as much as you can, okay? Cyberbullying, um, that starts about this age. That's something you really, really want to support your kids through because that can be very stressful with your support. It's not toxic stress, but um, be sure that you, you help them through that. And teach your kids critical thinking. Like they are amazing. Kids are amazing. Like if you say, okay, um, what's wrong with this picture? Or um, what do you see as, what's this person trying to sell you here? <clears throat> and teaching a critical eye, you know, like recognizing spam versus um, other stuff, like real ads, that kind of stuff. And recognizing stereotypes. And why we don't see video games like this. Why is it more marketed to boys and girls, right? Um, luring is common around this age, but um, that was probably one rule in our contract was that you never ever meet anyone online in person without an adult with you. That was something I really, really insisted on. And it was something that our kids all agreed to. Okay, those of you with teenagers, yay, I love this day, I love teenagers. Um, I just want to say, our kids, um, we stopped all punishments by the age of, by the, the age the youngest was 10 years old. So, <laughs> we used to do timeouts and consequences, and then we found, as the kids moved through age 8, 9, 10, that 
they realized we were the ones imposing the consequence. It wasn't them choosing the consequence. It was us imposing it. And um, they, it impaired our communication. They, they wouldn't talk to us. And that was not something we wanted for the teen years. Your teen years are the last third of parenting. You need open communication. So we dropped all punishments. We went only to problem solving. And um, our three youngest kids have never been punished, ever. And it can be done, absolutely. You, you, you teach kids that they are important. It's a love relationship. And that in love relationships, you don't punish people. You work things out and negotiate with them. So I'll just preface that. And then you have the teen years. The teen years are lovely years. You, you don't get any rebellion or attitude. It's amazing. <laughs> okay, problem solving. We will, let's move into that one. So, um, teens. Um, actually, maybe what I'll do at this point, I wonder if I could play a video. Hmm. Maybe I will. Okay, I'm going to play a video here and show you the difference between consequences and problem solving. Um, but I think, wait, okay, what I'll do is I'll show you another slide. Okay, so at teens, why do they love screens? At this age, there's a lot of appeal. It's, it's a playground that's not dominated or directed by adults, right? So teens that play on a basketball team, have coaches and adults telling them what to do but on the internet they don't so it's kind of nice it's uncontrolled they can explore social and sexual roles with few consequences they can pretend to be someone else and that's good they like that and they can be very creative okay and this shows you this is from my PT class but it shows you how much control you have when your child's born and how much you control you have when they're 18. <laughs> You're losing it along the way. <laughs> and that's good. I mean, kids are becoming independent. They're losing, you're losing your control as you should. But if your relationship's good and it's non-punitive, you grow your influence. And your influence is that little voice in their head that says, hmm, maybe I shouldn't do this. My mom, really warn me against doing this. I, I feel like I really shouldn't do this. That's your influence. And it's with them when you're not, which is very, very good. Okay. So this is teens development, early teens, all those lovely <laughs> hormones and things you've heard about. And then later teens. And you can see the development of their self-control, their focus, their flexibility, their working memory. It goes up. It takes another big leap from age 13 to age 25. And that's the best their brain's ever going to be at age 25. <laughs> and then it works really, really well and just goes down slightly. But last big leap is in the teen years. And that's why kids get a lot more serious around 17, 18. Now, they're definitely moving from users to creators. So this is what teens use. Okay. So your role here is um, for younger teens, you're still a teacher. But for older teens, you're now a mentor, right? So you can't really control what they do, but you have a lot of influence. Right, so you model good habits, um, you model your values, and you have a big impact on them. And again, you're helping them brainstorm for their problems. Number one safety tip, don't drive and use technology. If you do it, they'll do it. Okay, um, some safety tips. Okay. Make sure they don't meet online people. <laughs> Discuss personal versus private information. Discuss cyberbullying, online pornography, what healthy sexuality looks like. 
discuss file sharing and copyright, what are spam, phishing emails, virus attachments, teach password management, teach how to safely order, buy, and sell online, discuss online gambling and pornography risks, and discuss laws regarding nude photos, sending nude photos. <clears throat> now, again, teenagers are, they learn through their five senses. There's still a lot of kinesthetic learners there. They don't put everything in their mouths now. <laughs> now they mostly talk, talk to people. Okay? And like I said, a lot of times they can circumvent your limits because they, they grow up with this technology they know it. They know the back doors behind things. And remember, you've got a lot of conversations with your teens, right? You're in the final third of parenting, but you can have many, many conversations. And your teen will absorb your values. Not all of them, but some of them. If you're really at odds with your teen over screen time, a one-time consultation really works, is that if you ask them, to sit down with you and say, okay, can we talk about this? And then present all the things you found out about something, like maybe violent video games or whatever. Give your, present your case and then let the decision go with them. Like, they, they are, they're gonna make their own decisions. <coughs> Excuse me, at this point. <clears throat> I have a limit screen time here. <clears throat> like I said, do a one-time consultation. Separate the big issues from the small. Like, is it really that bad? Um, would you rather have them on inside playing a video game with their friends rather than looking for trouble on the streets on a Saturday night, <laughs> right? Um, biggest tip here is connect and then direct. So connect with your team. Go up to them and say, hey, wow, look at you. You made it up a level. That's really cool. Um, so is do you think you could take the garbage out by the time today's over? Because it really needs to take out. And hopefully your team will say yes. Okay, so <laughs> make sure you still give them chores, but give them a time frame that's reasonable for everyone. If you welcome teens friends, you can see a lot of socializing going on. Every time you go in to serve food or hand over a tray of something, you can see what they're doing too. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Spend time together with your teens. Um, a lot of families have their own Discord channel or um, Facebook group where they can share things. Um, again, never ever share anything of your teens without permission. They are very concerned now about privacy and the portrayal they portray to their friends. So um, you have to be very careful. I know parents of toddlers and preschoolers share all the time, but as your kids move into the school age years, they become a lot more sensitive of what people see. So definitely get their consent. Um, decide on who owns the problem. Um, if too much screen time, is it the effect? Does it make them really aggressive or grouchy? what's the problem and work out solutions. Okay, that's for, and um, teaching netiquette, get permissions before posting other people's information, so teaching your kids to do that, teach them to cool down before replying to anything. It's, it's really hard to get things back. It's like toothpaste once it's out of the tube. <laughs> Real world rules apply, so plagiarism, bullying. Write, always, always write as if everyone would read it. Don't post photos, obey social boundaries, like don't pull out your phone in the middle of a job interview, <laughs> and give FaceTime priority. I like that comment. <laughs> okay, the best controls are the internal ones we develop ourselves, and most kids do develop those internal controls. And parents matter. Don't think that you're not important at this age. You really, really do matter more than they. Good communication, keep that up. Listen, listen, listen. Um, listen more than you talk. Validate their feelings. Spend time together. This is what you get when you don't punish your teens. You get time together. 
problem solve, not punish. So punishment is taking away their communication lines and it leads to shutting down your communication line. And that's the best thing you have to keep them safe is that that ability for them to come to you and say, mom, dad, I have a problem. I need help. You want them to do that. And if you threaten to take away their devices, you might not get that. And the common parenting advice out there is set rules and enforce the rules by taking away technology. I totally disagree with that. Totally. Don't do that. <laughs> what do you do instead? You problem solve. Problem solve. Okay. Problem solving is great. It's not about you against them. It's you and them working together against the problem. You're on the same team. And kids can learn punishment from everyone else, but nobody teaches them how to problem solve. And that's a skill they need for the future. Um, I really outline a lot of it in my book, Discipline Without Distress. But um, you've probably heard this in a lot of the other workshops is what the, the bad part about punishment. It destroys communication, emotional connection, child's willingness to access your help ability to learn and your parental influence and that is what you need as kids get older even when your kids are 25 40 and they call you up and say hey can i have your thoughts on this that's influence that's what you want okay so so looking at what parents needs and children's needs children have a lot of needs with technology absolutely Okay, so let's talk about problem solving. So what problem solving is, is it's figuring out what is the problem, exploring what are your child's needs, what are your needs, and then getting your child first to come up with some ideas together. Get their ideas, write them down on paper, and then you go through each idea and figure out what meets both your needs, and then you do it. Oftentimes we write it on a paper and pin it to the wall so everybody knows what we agree to. Now, in two weeks, it's not working. What do you do? You go back and you do this whole thing again. Yes, this is time consuming, but it's a great way to teach your kids relationship skills. This is what they need to solve problems. Okay, um, I'm going to show you a video. Let's see, <laughs> it's kind of a um, I'm gonna just stop the recording right here. So problem solving is making sure kids get buy-in into this is getting their needs on the table first and giving them a chance to write down some ideas before you do. Um, and that way when they see you actually write down their ideas they really really buy into it and they think okay I'm going to be considered and it really does work absolutely because when kids get to teenage years they're going to meet their needs with or without our approval and a lot of times they sneak it they go underground and in problem solving you get your needs on the table and they want to cooperate they want to get their needs met um, but they also want you to get your needs met too Another thing you can do is use human touch. So um, give your kids lots of hugs, pats on the back, head pats. <laughs> Keep hugging them until they say no, and they won't. <laughs> and make sure you model boundaries. So um, live your, your balanced life too. So the five parenting pointers for school age teens are listen to them, connect with time, problem solve every discipline issue, Give them human touch, non-sexual touch, and model your boundaries. Okay. Seven keys of balance for us, or anybody, is to try and be present. Really participate in life. Make sure you have a day, a social activity, so it can be connecting with a friend, a phone call, spiritual activity, maybe yoga, church, financial activity, a job family activity, meal times, watching a movie, going for a walk, playing board games, physical activity, going for a walk, going to the gym, getting on the treadmill, mental activity, reading, learning something new um, for kids, it'd be school, homework, 
and hobby activities, something that we love to do. So make sure your day includes this in addition to screen time. And remember, you gotta put the rocks in first. Those are family, job, um, friends, people we love. And be part of their world. A lot of, a lot of families video game together, they connect on social media. I remember when my kids were in university in different cities and they'd hop on and a video game and, and play together and talk to each other and chat on how things were going. And they did that without us around. So it was kind of nice to see how we can connect with our family and friends. Um, there's many benefits. Maybe I'll go through a few of them. The internet, well, lots of information. What an amazing inter information source. This picture here is um, my son's graduation was broadcast over the internet so his grandmother in England could watch him graduate, which was amazing. Yay! <laughs> a lot of academic benefits of gaming. I think in our years we unschooled. Um, my kids grew all these skills just through playing video games. It was amazing. And with all those benefits, you got to ask, why do we not get more of our girls on? Because the boys are there. But if you look at Dota 2 or the big eSport games, there's women are very underrepresented. Let them be creative. A lot of times the games spur creativity. So we had artwork and we had little Kirbys they sewed and <clears throat> costumes and they wrote stories and did art. A lot of art. There's our Minecraft cakes. A lot of things that kids can make that spur their creativity. Role plays, costumes, <laughs> lots of costumes, artwork, funny memes. They are really amazingly creative. Yeah. Life skill benefits, it helps kids to zone out, helps parents zone out, teaches delayed gratification, focusing skills, builds their self-esteem and confidence when they win games, and it provides a source of emotional intelligence. <clears throat> so teaching kids how to manage their self-control instead of throwing their controller across the room. Socialization benefits of gaming. Team building, cooperation, group problem solving skills, even in games. Um, my son was with a guild of World of Warcraft for years and he, he helps the players solve their drama between each other. And opportunities and connection. Okay, I'm gonna end this and I just wanna read the parents' affirmation of imperfection. It's perfectly okay for me to be imperfect. This means not being a perfect parent. This means it's okay, I've already made a ton of mistakes as a parent, and it's okay, I'm gonna make mistakes in the future. What's not okay is for me to pretend that I am perfect and thereby hide my mistakes from myself. Instead, I'll catch my mistakes with a smile rather than a kick and learn what they have to teach me. That way, I won't make the same mistakes too often, and I'll never be a perfect parent, and that's okay, because my goal is excellence, not perfection. And the author is unknown. <clears throat> and you guys are all amazingly, amazingly excellent parents. So thank you for coming today. Um, keep in mind, yes, you can parent without punishment. And you can enjoy wonderful, wonderful kids. Here's some of the research that is very helpful in um, looking at screen time and especially the Palix Foundation for Brain Development was very helpful. And I would welcome any questions from you if you want to email me, um, come to my website at professionalparenting.ca and check out my books. Um, everything's on Amazon except for the unschooling one. Actually, I think you can pre-order that now. <laughs> and the Attention Parenting Tips was just released this week online. So maybe um, that would be helpful to you too. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to um, wish you all the best in your parenting journey. And remember, parenting without punishment is a continuum. Nobody does it one day and, and stops all their, their other things. It, it takes a while to let go. And 
Um, anything you do to move in that direction is a wonderful positive step. So congratulations. Okay, thank you. Bye everyone. Stay tuned for questions.